Center of Medicine and Biostats and Epi, and it's housed in the Division of uh, General Internal Medicine here at SFGH. Um, and she's going to talk today about her research, which is on um, health, and health and food insecurity and the relationship between the two. And I think um, it's really a great example for all of us on how to kind of do research and, and really work on a problem. So not only does, has she done a lot of research to identify the problem, but is also working to fix it in many different ways through intervention studies um, and through advocacy. She's on the board of the Marin and San Francisco Food Banks, as well as the California Food Policy Advocates Board. So um, really, in all aspects, trying to um, address this issue, which uh, I think rumor has it we're supposed to have a huge turnout. And I think it's an issue that affects all of us, and we all see how important it is for our patients. Um, and also, just to say, there's lots of people around here like this, but Hillary is one of them, a great clinician as well as researcher. So it's a pleasure to welcome Hillary. Thank you. All right, so um, when, you, when you ask sort of a general American to think or to picture in their mind um, hunger in America, what most people automatically gravitate towards is pictures of the Depression. And clearly, these, this is a picture of hunger in America. And this was um, an example, um, not the only example, of severe hunger in, New in America. Um, malnutrition, um, weight loss, and probably severe health outcomes that come from that. And when we ask people to talk about or to think about hunger more broadly or on a more global perspective, what people generally think about is this. This is also not the picture of an American today. We don't see this type of famine and starvation in the United States, which has led to this, um, this conundrum, which is... Um, that we have this perception that we have the myth of the starving Americans. And um, in this article by Warren Kozak, that happened just exactly a year today in the Wall Street Journal, um, he gave an entire um, um, op-ed piece about why there really isn't hunger in America. And in fact, according to the Census Bureau, 96% of parents classified as poor said their children were never hungry. Well, the first thing you respond, what about the other 4%? Do we not care about the other 4%? But the other thing is, that this really, um, for many, many reasons, misses the entire point of hunger in America. Because hunger doesn't look like this in America anymore. And the problem is that these images are very clear and very visual. But in fact, what hunger in America looks like now is more like this. And these are all lines, um, most of these pictures are taken from the lines at food pantries. Um, and many, many more of these people are obese and the rest of them are normal weight, and there are very few people who are underweight. So is there really hunger in America? How can there be hunger in the context of this, of this visual image of America? And what I hope to um, convince you of today um, is that we do have an obesity hunger paradox. It is very effective at covering up the hunger problem in America. Um, then we're gonna talk about four contributors to the, coexisting, the coexistence of obesity and hunger. And in the interest of providing some translational um, um, data for you, I'm going to talk about really fascinating work that's been done looking at genetic programming in the fetal environment, um, food affordability, episodic food availability, and stress. And then if we have enough time, we'll bring this all the way to the policy implications and what happens at the societal level as our nation struggles to, to address the coexistence of hunger and obesity. All right, so first, for some definitions, hunger. The way we conceptualize hunger is as a physical sensation. This is the discomfort that you feel when you lack access to food. Hunger is what happens when um, rounds go too long and you don't make it to lunch. Hunger is what happens when you are dieting. Or hunger is what happens when you don't have money for food. But it, it, at, at bottom level, it is a physical sensation. We use the term food insecurity not to cover up hunger, but because it encompasses a wide range of things that people do in order to avoid feeling hungry. So technically, food insecurity is the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods, or the limited ability to acquire acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. So if you, um, if you have to go to the food pantry to get food, if you have to send your kids to grandma's house, if you have to um, 
question you are food insecure. In the United States, food insecurity is all about money. It's our financial ability, inability to acquire food. Now, what's, what's fascinating about food insecurity is that people who are food insecure engage in many, many coping strategies in order to avoid going hungry. This is what we're genetically programmed to do. If you're hungry, you want to eat. So what do you, so what do, you do in order to avoid hunger? Well, these are some strategies that people use, and I put in italics the ones that could predispose you to obesity, and we're going to pull this apart over the course of the next half hour. You eat more low-cost foods. You eat more highly filling foods. You limit the variety of foods that you eat to a few low-cost items that you know will fill you up for a very small amount of money. You skip meals. You avoid food waste and you have your children. This is the clear your plate mentality, never letting the children leave anything on their plate. Eating less at each meal, skipping meals, uh, shopping strategies that save money. Um, in many food insecure households with children, the fridge or the pantry gets locked between meals so the kids can't take extra food. Um, sending your kids or, to, um, um, to relatives' houses or friends' houses or church for a meal. Um, we know at UCSF that there are many people who come to many of the, um, um, the academic lectures, um, primarily for the meal, people from the community. Food pantries or soup, soup kitchens, enrolling in federal nutrition pro um, programs, putting off other expenses, uh, trade-offs between am I going to pay for medication or am I going to pay for food, very common coping strategy, putting off paying the electrical bill, you only pay it every month, uh, I'm sorry, every other month. Um, uh, engaging in petty crime so that you'll be taken to jail where you know you'll get a couple of nice um, warm meals. And in San Francisco, we have good evidence that um, a significant percentage of the homeless population is coming primarily to um, for food, shelter, or a safe place to stay. Um, and some evidence that people come to PBS for a sandwich as well. So these are all coping strategies that people use in order to avoid feeling hungry, but these people are food insecure. They are worrying where their next meal will come from. And clearly, if this is sustained over time and this is severe enough, then over time you get that typical image of an American during the Depression or somebody in Sub-Saharan Africa during a famine of malnutrition, hunger, and weight loss. The question is, what happens in the U.S. when these coping strategies are able to predominate because the caloric environment offers so many opportunities for calories? And that's what we'll be talking about. The most recent data on food insecurity is from 2011, and it shows that 15% of households in the U.S. are food insecure. That means that one in seven Americans almost, uh, more than one in seven Americans live in a food insecure household. Most of these people are in this low food security category. These are people who are able to use those coping strategies on the last slide such that they never feel hungry. They're still food insecure, but they don't feel hungry. They don't skip meals. They don't go an entire day without eating. They're not losing weight. The other 5.7% are, are in a very low food security household, going all day without eating and losing weight. This very low food security category includes 12 million adults and 8.6 million children. Not an, not an insignificant problem. Um, and 50 million people overall in the U.S. live in a food insecure household. So that's that 14. Okay, if you take the 50 or 60 studies that have looked at food insecurity and obesity in a robust way and have looked after controlling for a bunch of other measures for, of socioeconomic status, you get a very complicated picture, which um, this does a semi-reasonable job of summarizing um, in one breath. These double asterisks here show you areas in which the evidence is completely consistent that food insecurity is associated with obesity. And this is among women in particular and among adults overall um, with weight gain. And then these stars show you where the evidence is, is, is maybe no association, maybe a positive association. What you see, the, the interesting thing here is we don't see this relationship in men. There are a lot of hypotheses for why this might be so. Men may get a lot more occupational physical activity at this socioeconomic status. Men may process stress differently. They may eat differently in response to stress as women. We don't know. But for the rest of the talk, it, except for when I, when I tell you otherwise, we're concentrating mostly on this relatively consistent relationship we see here among um, women between food insecurity and obesity. Um, I will just interject here. I'm not going to talk a lot about children today. The evidence is also um, up and down among 
on children, a lot of food insecurity is associated with obesity. Um, certainly in some studies, using some measures, uh, it is, but it's not, it's not a slam dunk association. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so let's start by talking about genetic programming and the fetal environment, um, which I think is a fascinating topic. In 1962, James Neal came out with this hypothesis that he called the thrifty gene hypothesis. And he developed it to explain diabetes, not obesity, although it has since been, um, it, it is easily extrapolated to talk about the obesity epidemic. And what Dr. Neal proposed was that our genetic predisposition for diabetes was adapted to cycles of feast and famine. So what he was essentially saying was that we have in our genetic code some alleles that are what he called thrifty alleles. And if you had the thrifty allele, you would very efficiently accumulate fat and store energy so that during the famine, when, when lots of people in your community died off, the people who were left were the people with the thrifty alleles because they had enough fat stored to get through the famine. And it was those people with the thrifty alleles who then went on to reproduce and, and stud the entire population with people who were enriched with this thrifty allele. That's a beautiful explanation for why there's so much diabetes and obesity in our society. It makes sense to people. And we still see people talking about this a lot. The problem is that most of the evidence we have suggests that this isn't true. Some of it is anthropological evidence. They, they, we don't see a lot of famine pressure in historical populations that show the highest rates of obesity and diabetes. We also, in contemporary societies that maintain more traditional hunter-gatherer um, or subsistence farming um, ways of life, we don't see those people becoming obese during times of food availability. So although this makes a ton of sense, it doesn't seem to be true. Now the people who are really attached to the thrifty gene hypothesis will say, well, what you need is just an enormous caloric deluge, that you would never see this in this population because they would never have access to 4,000 calories a day. But in the U.S., we do have access to 4,000 calories a day. And, and maybe there is something to say for that. But, but as it stands, most people think this isn't true, and this has evolved towards what we now call the thrifty phenotype hypothesis, which is a little bit different, and which states that we're, rather than a genetic predisposition, rather than the thrifty allele that's been passed down through generations to get us through the famine, instead, developmental pressures in the womb predispose us to obesity and diabetes. And essentially, um, that the developing fetus, if it's exposed to a very nutrient-poor environment, anticipates that it's going to enter a life of famine, and that it may better make changes to its metabolism that will adapt, that will make it able to survive in a famine environment. We therefore sometimes call this the thrifty epigenomic hypothesis. Epigenetic, very big changes across the entire genetic code take place so that the entire organism's metabolism is changed, efficiently accumulate fat, efficiently store energy, and predispose you to obesity and diabetes later on. This is the hypothesis. Now, this is super scary because what this suggests is that we're passing along this obesity from generation to generation. So now you may say, well, who... Who are these fetuses being exposed to a nutrient-poor environment? And what people have argued is, it's the fetuses of the women coming here. If you don't have adequate micronutrient intake, if you don't have adequate protein intake, then what the fetus is adapting to, what the fetus sees, even though mom is eating two or 3,000 calories a day, potentially, what the fetus is seeing is famine. This fetus is seeing a nutrient-poor environment. This is the... This is the um, hypothesis. Okay. So this is called the predictive adaptive response. And it really looks at the mismatch between the environment that the, that the fetus sees, the prenatal environment, and the environment that the fetus is actually delivered into, the postnatal environment. So what you see down here is the prenatal environment. And here is the postnatal environment. And what you see is that if you have an adequate prenatal environment, pregnant, and you're delivered into an adequate postnatal environment, you have an appropriate predictive adaptive response, your homeostatic mechanisms stay in place, you're in normal weight. Now, of course, you could flood this. If I was eating 4,000,
1,000 calories a day, I would end up obese too, but in general, I'm going to end up in this region here. Now, you take a deprived prenatal state here, and you put it into an environment of huge calories, and you don't have a predictive response. You overwhelm that predictive response and end up obese. This is the theory. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, the theory states that if you have an adequate prenatal environment, you can adjust to a wide range of postnatal environments. This is good because your mom may teach you to eat lots of fruits and vegetables or she may teach you to eat few. Your standard in your home may be a 1,200-calorie dinner or maybe an 800-calorie dinner. doesn't matter so much if you're in this range, but the potential range of responses that are appropriate in the deprived environment is much smaller. Does that make sense to people? Okay. Visible from far away. <coughs> let me let me talk you through this. So this is your mom and your dad. They give you your genetic and your epigenetic inheritance. In the womb, lots of changes are made through fetal development, and your the fetus is able to use these clues to predict whether they're going to be born into a sparse environment, an average environment, or a rich environment. And then postnatal clues allow them to further develop, but only within a limited range. And if this arrow here shows increasing risk of metabolic disease in a nutritionally rich environment, your, the, the fetuses who predict a rich environment are going to do the best, and those that predict a sparse environment are going to do the worst. All right, is there any data for this hypothesis? Well, actually, the data goes back quite a long time. This was published, published in the New England Journal in 1976. And it was looking at the very excellent records that were kept in the Netherlands on health status uh, during, at the end of World War II when there was both a very long winter and the war had been going on for years and there was, <coughs> there was a huge famine. And what they did is they looked 19 years later, and men know less, where we don't expect this relationship to be very keen, uh, and their obesity rates. And what you see over here is these kids here were exposed to the famine only postnatal. So they were essentially too old. They didn't, they didn't predict in the womb that they were going to be born into a famine. These kids here were in the womb during extreme famine, and this is the percent of kids who are obese, and 19 years later, those kids who during the second and third trimester were, were, were in utero during the second and third trimester, those are the kids who ended up 19 years later obese. And then the famine ended, and this, and this is what happened. And this is the control condition from countries that, in Europe that weren't exposed to the famine. So evidence going back quite some time. So how can we explain this? There are a lot of mouse models of food insecurity. All you have to do is take food away from the mouse in sort of a cyclic fashion, and you have food insecurity. There's also a lot of data from the dieting literature, which is called dieting data, but frankly, if you take food away from the mouse, the mouse doesn't know, if the, the, the mouse doesn't think they're dieting. It's not volitional, it, it's, it's food insecurity. And what we see from both of this literature, and, and we try to keep those straight, but truthfully, I think there's a lot of overlap here. What we see is that when mice are exposed to episodic restriction of nutrients and calories and protein, they prefer calorically dense foods. Again, I'm italicized the things that you might imagine result in obesity. They prefer calorically dense foods. They hoard food. They become aggressive. They increase their body fat and decrease their lean muscle mass. They, they gain weight more quickly with weak eating, and they develop glucose intolerance. So it, it speaks for itself. All right. So now, kid is born into an environment that they predict will be a famine environment, um, but it isn't a famine. We have, we have so many calories in this environment that there is, there is far mismatched to what they predict. The problem is not all calories are created equal. So when the obesity hunger paradox actually came out, there wasn't a lot of connection with these early famine studies or with um, predictive adaptive responses. And really, the first hypothesis centered around food affordability and how to avoid that physical sensation of hunger. And this model was developed by Peter Bastiernes, and it's a little complicated. This here is the amount of money you spend on food. And if you spend a lot of money on food, if you're like most of us in this room, you spend a lot 
lot of money up here on food, you eat enough food, you eat the kinds of food you want, and you're able to maintain your caloric needs, which is this line here, <laughs> while spending a lot of money on food. This is how we envision hunger. This is how, how Walter Conkey of the Wall Street Journal envisions hunger. You spend not a, not a lot of money on food, you're not able to maintain your caloric requirements, your weight goes down, uh, and you end up with sort of the picture of the Depression or the picture of famine in Africa. The problem is we don't see a ton of this in America. What we see is this group of people. And these people are spending less money on food. They're getting enough food. They're meeting their caloric requirements, but they're not eating the kinds of foods they would otherwise be eating. And the change in the kinds of food, in conjunction with the eating behaviors that we'll talk about later on, allow people to maintain their caloric requirements or even to overshoot their caloric requirements and end up obese. So, uh, ignore the y-axis here. This axis shows you the cost of foods per calorie. And you will see that if you have the least amount of money for, to spend on food, if I asked you to try to get your 1,800 calories a day on $2, and you wanted to do that as efficiently as possible, you would eat oil, shortening, margarine, and sugar. And if I increased your budget slightly, you may be able to afford bread, pasta, and rice. Now, this is familiar to, to many people coming to seek care here. This is the conundrum. And what you see over here, the most expensive foods calorie for calorie are fruits and vegetables in these, in these squares and um, triangles that are lightly shaded. Now, there is a lot of political power invested in proving that this isn't true. And I will tell you straight up that you can eat very healthy on a very limited budget. But you have a very limited variety of foods, and it takes you a long time in food preparation. Now, when you ask, um, when you ask a low-income woman what do you mean when you say healthy foods are too expensive? It isn't just the amount of money you have to pay at the grocery store. It's that, but it's also that it takes time to prepare that food. It's much easier to put chicken nuggets in the microwave than it is to peel carrots. It requires equipment for storage and preparation, which means your electricity has to be on and your stove has to work and you have to not be living in a car. It requires time and money to get to a grocery store that stocks an adequate variety of foods and high enough quality foods that you want to feed it to the rest of your family. And it also, you know, we hear mothers say a lot that they really worry about introducing their child to a new food uh, if it's going to get left on the plate or serve it to their husband if it's going to get left on the plate. Because when you have a limited amount of money to spend, leaving a dollar or two of extra food on the plates of the people in your household is a big deal. This graph shows the consumer price index for food in this dark black line. That's the average price of an average, of a typical market basket of food in the United States. You see that that's been going up between 1980 and 2010. Hasn't been going up a lot. Thankfully, we have this line of sugar sweetened carbonated beverages here that's holding the CPI for food down, making food relatively affordable for the typical American. And what's pulling the CPI for food up is fresh fruits and vegetables and this line, which includes um, frozen and canned um, fr uh, fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables are becoming more expensive over time, and sugar sweetened beverages and non-alcoholic beverages and milk is, is staying about the same or becoming relatively less expensive. So this is becoming a greater problem over time, not a lesser problem. Part of this is just supply and demand. The per capita availability of fruits and vegetables in the United States is declining. We don't have enough fruits and vegetables in the entire U.S. food supply to meet USDA recommendations. If tomorrow everybody in the U.S. decided they wanted to eat five, fruits, five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, we couldn't do it. We just don't have it. And that's one of the reasons why pressures go up, costs go up. All right. It is also true when you're talking about affordability that for a small increase in price, you can get out of those typical cheap fruits and vegetables and get in 
to rather than just broccoli and carrots, you can get something a little more desirable. The problem is that low-income households here for 2009 data already spend 36% of their budget on food. This is an astronomical proportion of the budget on food. It doesn't make a big difference for those of us in the middle and the highest quartiles, the quartiles of income. You know, we're spending, we're spending, you know, six to eleven percent of our budget on food. Very, very high percentage of the of the of the income of a low income household is already spent on food. So when you ask people to make small changes in their dietary intake, you have a big problem. A diet with five servings of fruits and vegetables and a, and a serving of protein every day, uh, as recommended by the USDA, would require a low-income family to spend 43 to 70 percent of their food budget on fruits and vegetables. Now, the problem is if you do that, you're no longer able to maintain your caloric requirements. Then you make somebody who's food insecure without hungry, without hunger, into someone who's food insecure with hunger. That's a problem. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to make that choice. Increasing consumption of potassium. Now, potassium is in fruits and vegetables, so you increase your potassium by eating more fruits and vegetables. The most expensive of the four USDA-recommended nutrients and the new USDA recommendations for dietary intake would add $380 per year to the average consumer's food cost. $380. The average food stamp benefit in California is $5 a day. When you're talking about $380 additional per year, this is enormous. Meanwhile, each time consumers obtain 1% more of their daily calories from saturated fat and added sugar, their food costs significantly decline. So big financial pressures towards eating poor foods. Now, what does this do to weight and obesity? Well, who knows what decreased dietary variety does. This is the patients who tell you they eat oatmeal for every meal or they eat macaroni and cheese for every meal. We know that patterns of dietary patterns that um, include a very high consumption of cal calorically dense foods, lots of refined grains, lots of added sugars and fats are related to weight gain and obesity. We also know that dietary patterns that include low levels of fruits and vegetables are related to weight gain and obesity. So it's not surprising then that these food insecurity coping strategies are resulting uh, in obesity. And again, we don't know what the reduced micronutrient intake does, but we suspect by the by the thrifty phenotype hypothesis and um, predictive adaptive responses that this may be doing something to the next generation. Okay, I mentioned this very quickly because I think it's really interesting that we've gotten there's been so much press lately about the lack of full service grocery stores in low income neighborhoods, which I think is a big problem. Um, but I want to emphasize to you. Um, that the problem is probably more about affordability and that we would have more demand in low-income neighborhoods for fresh fruits and vegetables if they were more affordable. So this is a brand new study from Adam Grunowski from the American Journal of Public Health that shows um, the shopping habits of people who live in the lowest socioeconomic areas and the highest socioeconomic areas. And you see that, you're, that as you socioeconomic status goes up in these black bars here, you're more likely to shop at a high-priced grocery store and you're less likely to shop at this medium price grocery store. Sorry, less likely to shop at the low price grocery store that you see in this gray bar. Don't look at all the numbers here. I just want to give you a general, if you just scan these p values here, what it will tell you is that shopping at a low price grocery store is way more important for obesity than where it is. You can change how far it takes to get to the grocery store. And obesity rates may change a little bit, but not much, not after controlling. But what makes a consistent difference is whether your grocery store is high-priced. Now, what does a high-priced grocery store offer you? Lots of fruits and vegetables, beautiful fruits and vegetables, and much data suggests more low-fat options. Uh, many of these um, less expensive grocery stores, for example, only stock whole milk. Only stock, uh, they don't stock um, low fat cheese as consistent. Okay, so that's food affordability, and I'm going to turn now to talking um, a little bit about episodic food availability, which I alluded to a little bit before. Food insecurity is not constant. If you live in a food insecure 
your household. You don't have worries about feeding your children, for example, every day, 365 days a year. It goes up and down. And this is because <coughs> available budget changes throughout the month in a, in a household living paycheck to paycheck. So this is called the food stamp cycle. Food stamps are now called SNAP. SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, to get rid of the food stamp stigma, we just changed the name. Um, the, so your food stamps or your paycheck comes in once a month, and if you're living paycheck to paycheck, that might run out by the end of the month, and so for the last few days of the month, you may be food insecure, no money left. There may be seasonal variation, which we'll talk about in a minute. You may have something happen, often a medical something, you got to pay for your antibiotic. Dad gets pneumonia, you pay for the antibiotic, it costs you $80, that's your $80 that you were going to spend on food. On average, this happens seven months of the typical year. During seven months of the typical year in a food insecure household, there is some period of food inadequacy. And we see this mostly among mothers. Why is this? Well, in the U.S., um, the um, pressures on the household fall mostly to the women in single mother house in single parent households, and to some extent to the adults in in households with uh, um, mothers and fathers or extended generations. What does this mean? The kids are protected from the nutritional effects of food insecurity because they get fed first. The moms reduce their caloric intake so that the kids will have enough, or they they're the ones who eat the oatmeal and they give the protein to the kids. So this is. Um, data looking at the expenditure, at food stamp expenditures by the day of the month. This is the day zero, you can't really see that. This is the day zero when the food stamps arrive. And what you see is this, there's this ginormous run to the grocery store to spend the food stamps. These people are, there's no food left in the house here. And they get their food stamps spent and all of that money gets spent in the first couple of days. And then for the rest of the month there's a little bit of variability, but essentially everybody is just waiting for this, for these food stamps benefits. Here's an example of the seasonal variation. This study was done um, um, by Jay Bhattacharya just in, at Stanford, looking at what happens to people's expenditures when there's an unexpected cold snap, 10 degrees colder in an unexpected season. And you see in the black bars here the poor households and the white bars here the rich households. Okay, so everybody's expenditures on fuel go up. This, this is, was done in the North. Everyone's expenditures on fuel go up. A little, they go up a little bit less in the poor households and the rich households, but, but everyone's goes up. This is food <coughs> consumed at home. And you see in the rich households, people spend more money on food during the cold, cold snap. And the poor households, what happens? They already spent their money on heat. There's nothing left. Food expenditures go down. So this, these are the kind of pressures that seven months of the year force people to make changes in their eating habits. We also see these cycles of demand in more indirect ways. Uh, food banks and soup kitchens will tell you that their demand for services goes way up in the last days of the month. Um, there's been a lot of re um, journalist interviews with big box re retailers during the economic recession, and what you will notice from those um, from those stories are that the um, big box retailers increase their inventory and increase their staffing in the first days of the month because they anticipate this increase in demand during those days when benefits arrive. Grocery store scanning receipts, people buy more, uh, they buy more expensive foods during the first days of the month. And then we actually can see this in dietary intake among women when we actually have people record everything that they're eating. What we see is that over the course of the month, women's calories, carbs, vitamins, and fruit and vegetable intake in low-income households. Uh, here's one example from a long, long time ago, but we, we can see this today, too. This is a, um, a study that gives, um, these are people who get a normal food supplement, the federal food supplement money to buy food, and these are the people who got an additional food supplement as part of this intervention, and of course they're eating more, but what you'll see, this is the number of food servings per week that they're eating, even in the, even in the supplemented group, everybody's food intake is going down. Even with supplementation, they don't have enough to maintain their usual eating practices during the fourth week of the month. And this is what you hear people say in qualitative studies. The last week of each 
month, it is an internal panic. Where am I going to get enough food to eat? Okay, I will read this to you because it's kind of small. This was a really interesting study done among U.S. citizens, conscientious objectors to the war, who were offered the opportunity to enter a study in which they would restrict their food access until they lost 25% of their body weight. That would be like me losing 35 pounds. Uh, and then maintain their caloric, that, love, that BMI for um, an extended duration of time. Subjects became increasingly focused on food. They collected recipes, hung pinup pictures of food, and changed career plans to food-related activities such as becoming a chef. They grew increasingly upset and irritable, fighting with each other and their, girl and their girlfriends. The men appeared apathetic and lethargic and seemed to lose interest in sex, replacing pictures of women with their food pinups. In some respects, the most striking change occurred during the semi-starvation period and after weight was restored. That semi-starvation period is when they were just maintaining their weight. And after weight was restored to normal in the study, it ended. When the men were subsequently allowed to eat as much as they wanted, these previously normal, healthy eaters began to gorge themselves when attractive foods were available. Moreover, they reported feeling out of control of their eating and obsessed with food. Some even stole food or gum. Food restriction actually appeared to produce binge eating in previously normal eaters. Now, what you could say is this, this has nothing to do with the U.S. today. These people lost 25% of their body weight. And yet, if you really look at the interesting parts of this, the irritability, the fighting, the apathy, feeling out of control, gorging themselves, obsessions with food, binge eating, these are the exact same things that food insecure women tell us. It's the same things happening. We don't see them because we don't ask as much. But in studies, in qualitative studies, this is what people describe. So here's just some examples of the binge eating. I buy a big five-pound block of cheese twice a month, and when that first comes into the house, it's like everybody's ravenous after stuff. Towards the first part, the first of the month, they always eat probably more than they should because they get so excited. And again, with the food hoarding, this first quote was from a study done among um, veterans who had had food insecurity experiences during the war. So mission lasted longer than they expected, and they, they ran out of rations. And, and these were unselected veterans. These are not people selected for having severe food insecurity experiences. Almost half of the veterans attending the focus groups, focus groups carried one or more chocolate bars with them and said they always had sweets on them. Now this is interesting because if you ask your patients, try it sometime, ask if, if their patients are carrying food in their purse, you will be shocked at how many of our patients carry food in their purse. And this is this, this is this <coughs> desire to always have food in I have this phobia about food, and remembering that experience of having no food, now I constantly have to have food in the house. We start getting low, and I start freaking. This is this exact same urge that we saw in these World War II veterans. So we know from more quantitative studies that food insecurity is associated with disordered eating practices. As I mentioned, binge eating, hoarding, food obsessions, especially among children, you hear stories of children in food insecure households who will come home from school and sit in front of the refrigerator and stare at the refrigerator until dinner time. Uh, or kids who will only eat a certain food, uh, often a food that mom can't afford, and are obsessed with that food. Uh, the extreme avoidance of food waste, which, we, which I alluded to earlier, and then strong preferences for highly filling foods that, that make people feel as if they're not, they're not going to be. All right, and finally, I will devote a little bit of time to stress, um, although it's more difficult to talk about because I think it's very difficult to tease out how the exact relationships between food insecurity, stress, and obesity. It's very difficult to figure out which direction this relationship goes, and in fact, um, the structural equation model and studies that have been done suggest that it goes probably both. Food insecurity is very stressful. That is clear. But also, stress in somebody's life may make it more difficult to hold down a job, may make it more difficult to engage in some of these coping strategies, and then you're less able to respond to um, 
budgetary pressures that make it difficult to afford food. So probably this goes both ways. And the stress occurs both at the level of the individual and at the level of the household. Uh, particularly when there's more than one adult trying to, trying to figure out what the budget priority should be. So mom really wants to eat more fruits and vegetables, but it's going to cost more money. And, but her doctor keeps telling her she's got to stop eating so much rice. And dad says, we don't have the money for that because I have to afford gas because if I don't afford gas, I can't get to my job. So this, these are the household dynamics that get very difficult. I didn't talk a lot about children, but a lot of the, there's very good data in children about the effects of food insecurity, much better than we have studies in adults. What is clear, though, is that um, many of these mental health symptoms that we see we can attribute to the lack of nutrients and the very high sugar, high fat diets. But many of these are also probably related to stress in the household. So you see a lot of aggression, hyperactivity, anxiety, and passivity in children, even very young children who are in food insecure households. And we originally attributed all of that to decreased nutrients, but I suspect that much of that is stress. Um, also a lot of adolescent dysthymia and suicidal ideation. There are very good studies going on now that show the discordance between the adults in the family and the kids in the family. And these studies show over and over, adults say, we don't have enough money for food, but we totally shield the children. The children don't even know. Uh, and, you know, we, I do all these things. So, you know, maybe there's a little less meat at the dinner, but the kids don't notice because they get the same as they usually got. And the kids who say, well, I know my parents are trying really hard, but really I try to go eat at somebody else's house at least two nights a week because I know that makes it easier for my parents. Or it, you know, the kids always know. The parents always think that they're shielding. The kids know. And why do they know? It's all about stress. We also know that mothers are significantly more likely to be depressed and anxious if they live in food insecure households. Um, and this is just one study. Um, that showed that in, in low income, all, all of these women are low, in, very low income women. As food insecurity goes up, your levels of stress, anxiety, and depression go up as well. There um, are even some people on the radical end of this who suggest that um, there is no evidence, and th this part is true, there is no evidence that fixing food insecurity in our nation would fix obesity, at least in the, in the very low income population. But there's a lot of evidence that if we fix the stress associated with food insecurity and poverty in general, that we would make a big impact on the obesity. A lot of parents are really, really worried that their children will be taken out of their homes for, for neglect if they're unable to feed them. And in households, this is where a lot of the stress comes from among the parents. I was so scared my son would be taken away. When I see my cupboard becoming empty, I wonder how I'm going to fill it again and I get panicky. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, the, the stresses of dealing with chronic disease. A diabetic is supposed to eat three meals a day and something before going to bed, but sometimes I don't have the three meals and that makes me worry. We know that this chronic stress is associated with weight gain. <laughs> So then to conclude this part, I just want to say, I, you know, I'm quoting the economist here, but it has to happen every once in a while, that this, made, this seems so out there when you first think about it, and yet hopefully at this point it now seems obvious why we would, we would have obesity and food insecurity coexisting. Throughout human evolution, until the recent development of agriculture, people were food insecure with severe hunger by today's definition. They frequently experienced hunger for the entire day. Hunger is a mechanism to ensure what we eat, to ensure we, we eat when we find food and then we eat as much as we can. Perhaps we should consider weight gain by the food insecure women as a normal process. After all, if people are hardwired to eat as much as they can when food is plentiful, compared to times of relative food scarcity, then we should expect this weight gain to occur in our food rich country. Now, part of this here, you can see, is, is sort of this persistence of James Neal's thrifty gene hypothesis, which we know now is not true. But it has captured, it is so, it, it is so compelling for people because it seems so intuitively true. And we know, even without believing in the thrifty gene hypothesis, that there are, that there are very powerful other pressures towards eating behaviors that predispose people to obesity. Okay. In the interest of getting you all the way from the big
Advantage to Society, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of the hunger safety net. These, this is what people rely on when they become food insecure. A number of government programs that provide food, you don't have to read these very small ones, the two biggest ones are SNAP or Food Stamps and WIC. Our private and public partnerships that include food banks and soup kitchens, congregate meal sites and homeless shelters that provide food. And then these informal metric, met, networks that are sending kids to grandma's house or, or your church or things like that. These are the ones that we see most here. SNAP is an entitlement program. So the U.S. government calculates everybody who's eligible for SNAP benefits at the end of the year, and Congress is required to set aside money to cover all of those people for the entire year. Now, only 70% of eligibles overall in the U.S. are actually enrolled in SNAP, but they're not going to run out of money because Congress has set that aside. In California, by the way, only 50% of eligibles are actually enrolled in SNAP. That's a, that is in distinction to WIC, which, um, which is a grant program and theoretically could run out of money. It gets a certain amount of money at the beginning of the year, and if lots of additional people sign up, which they have during the recession, it causes a lot of financial pressure and theoretically benefits contract. You have to have an income less than 130% of a federal poverty level with deductions and be a U.S. citizen or a legal <coughs> immigrant to enroll in the SNAP program. WIC covers people up to 185% of the federal poverty level, and you don't have to be documented. This is one of the few federal benefits that's like this, and this is because it is so clear, the scientific evidence is so clear that being food insecure as a child gives you profound developmental disability that you can never catch up on. And this has been for decades that this the, the program was initially designed with this understanding. SNAP benefits come in an EBT card that look like this in California. They're automatically um, filled with money once a month. Uh, and WIC comes with a voucher for specific foods that you have to take to a WIC approved vendor. This, for example, is for $10 worth of fruits and vegetables. The controversy in the past has been because many, many studies showed that people on SNAP were more obese. If you're engaging in these behaviors, but you now have more money for your highly filling, nutrient-poor, uh, but calorically dense foods, then maybe you're more obese. The more recent studies that have done a much better job of controlling for the differences of people who decide to enroll in SNAP and the people who don't, very clearly show that SNAP is actually associated with a reduction in obesity. But on Capitol Hill, you see this all the time. Food stamps are making people and this has been a very hard thing. Actually, in JAMA, three weeks ago, there was a Walter Willett article about alluding to the fact that food stamps make people fat. It's not true, um, but the original data said that, and it's become very politically charged. There are numerous health advantages associated with it. The main controversies in SNAP right now are twofold. One, how do we know when people get enough SNAP benefits? Do we want to pull everybody out of food insecurity? And the second is, should SNAP benefits cover everything? Right now, they won't, they cover anything except for tobacco and alcohol. In most locations, they don't cover any already prepared foods. They cover raw ingredients or seeds. You can play around seeds. Um, but the idea is, well, maybe we could just fix our obesity problem by making food stamps only, only cashable for healthy food. And we, we can talk about that more at some other time. I'm going to end with this slide, which harkens back to that original slide of famine in Africa, which is to say we have this perception, which is true, that there's a lot of hunger in the world. And there is. And there's a lot of malnourishment, and it is an enormous problem. But if you look at developing countries across, across the world, what you will see is that the burden of overnutrition and overweight among women, we're still talking about women here, is greater in most countries than the burden of undernutrition. Why is this? Because the globalization of food markets has put the same economic pressures on women and households in the rest of the world as it's putting on the as it has put on the US. And so even though we can consider the obesity hunger paradox right now as a US problem, it will very rapidly, I think, emerge as a global problem particularly if we're able to fix this, the, the famine and the extreme undernourishment that we see um, in the most poor of these countries. And I'll stop there.
something like um, funneling those collected uh, fees into SNAP or other supplemental uh, food programs is a better solution, or what? It, what is your well, sense of the benefits? Or the, I will. Uh, this is what I will say. Uh, I do think that a, that a soda tax is a regressive tax, and I worry about that. What I don't at all support is taking the an environmental problem, which is our food environment, and trying to fix it only in a low-income household because that's where obesity rates are are the highest. This is the, the, the cheap profusion of massive calories is everybody's problem. It's not just a low-income problem. So I don't support measures that are exclusively limited to SNAP benefits. And that, those measures are on the table. Um, I do think that measures that affect the food environment overall are going to be very important in the obesity benefit. Um, and that there is probably a very good case to be made uh, for sugar sweetened beverage taxes to be part of that solution. I will also say that um, SNAP benefits are not taxed. So when you spend your SNAP benefits on soda, you get them more cheaply than if you pay for them out of your own pocket. So if we if we take, um, if we disallow SNAP benefits to pay for sugar-sweetened beverages, it, it's sort of a double whammy. The price will go up very, very steeply for a low capacity. And you can argue whether that's appropriate or inappropriate. I think it's not appropriate. There are very reasonable people who think we should take sugar sweetened beverages out of the snack package. Uh, I'll ask this one. So lots of things to do in terms of advocacy. If there's like one thing, what do you think is the best thing that we could all help get on the bandwagon for and advocate around all this? For me, it's the prices of fruits and vegetables, and we should reduce the prices of fruits and vegetables. There's good data that suggests if you make the healthy food option as cheap as the unhealthy food option that people go for it. And, and you know, and these are like workplace studies that show this. It's not a panacea, but it doesn't change normative shopping behaviors. And the problem is when we make the solutions outside of normative shopping behaviors, it doesn't affect the neighborhood uh, in a way that we want. So if we can increase demand for fresh fruits and vegetables in the neighborhood, then the neighborhoods usual will respond, the vendors will respond by stocking what there's demand for. And that, and that is a long-term solution that differs from a short-term solution.